Happy New Year, listeners. It's a new year, and that means more podcasts. This week's episode features a guest. That means two weeks of guest episodes. For me, this one was a little bit easier to control because it was only one guest, and I'm happy to say it was my friend John Drum. John and I worked together about seven or eight years ago, and he actually started doing this thing where he would send out interesting articles to a distribution list. There are some days where John sends one or two articles, and there are other days where John sends out dozens in a given day. He is prolific. He's been doing this for years. And it was most certainly an inspiration for starting the distribution list for my source material. Over the last two or three months, I've been covering random topics about China. We've been exchanging emails. He's been giving me ideas. He's been giving me encouragement. And I started to back into this idea about doing a podcast about China, specifically their use and their expertise in artificial intelligence and have a conversation about where we think the country is going with the technology that they're using. It was a great conversation, and I'm very pleased to present to you SourceCast episode 101. We're talking about China. You know, I've spoken to a lot of small business people. I haven't spoken to anybody big. The message is actually frightening because they really have no idea. My guess is, is once the small businesses sense that somebody's breathing down their back, they're going to be looking for somebody to help them out. You know, what do I do? What do I do? That type of thing. But like I said, most people, I've spoken to about a hundred small businesses and most people don't see anything coming our way that they haven't seen yesterday. And I think that's a mistake. All right. So we'll pretend like we just signed. <laughs> we'll pretend like I just, uh, <laughs> you just logged in. Hello, Joey. How are you? Good, John. How are you? <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much for joining today. My pleasure. So before we get into our main topic, let's do a little bit of background as to who you are and why you're interested in this topic. John, you and I, I don't like to mention the name of the company that I work for, but you and I worked together, what, seven or eight years ago? That's true. That's true. Long-time listeners of the podcast know that I'm in supply chain management, and that's that's where you came on, right? Or were you in the IT role before that? I was in a variety of different roles. We moved a lot of stuff offshore. We did a lot of analysis. Um, we had we had some agreements some other, with other large firms to do different pieces of the business. So I was involved with quite a few of those. So you were doing a lot of BPO work? Yes. Well, that that's a nice tie-in. But before we get into our topic of China, give me a little bit of background as to your education, how you came up, and the things that you specialize in. My education is in IT. I started out as an IT developer many moons ago. I got some tremendous opportunities early on to develop some system-level software with a team of other fellows. From there, I went into writing some monitor software. Um, we were able to monitor a variety of different systems from a central platform and respond to issues. I'm a geek at heart. I'm especially passionate these days about uh, artificial intelligence. When I got done with my education many, many moons ago, I was always, I always kept an eye on artificial intelligence and it was always, it always excited me and, and it seems to be flowering these days and I'm watching it as closely as I can and it's an exciting time. I always appreciate the emails that you send me. You're always keeping me informed. There's always a really good article that I somehow miss or haven't seen and you're always the guy that's sending it to me. Well, I enjoy that as well. I've got a variety of different interests. Uh, like I mentioned, artificial intelligence is one of them. But I guess probably the broader overall arching theme is the impact of technology on society, you know, as we move into our ex exponential change curve going forward. And, and that interests me tremendously and spent a lot of time reading about it, Joey. Episode 100 of SourceCast, the original plan was to, uh, I had a bunch of millennials on. They're friends of mine and uh, I've worked with most of them or all of them, I should say. And I was like, are you guys afraid of AI messing your jobs up specifically because you have another 20 years after me from a career perspective for at least 15 years. And that's when I think AI is really going to hit in about 15 or 20 years. And they're like, no, we're, we're cool. <laughs> I yeah. kind of had to pivot yeah. on that episode. But how about you? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of benefit out of it. I think it's going to bring dramatic change to the business landscape. When is it going to happen? Might be five years out. It's actually occurring now, but um, the big impact might be five years out. It might be a decade out. But I think it's inevitable. And if, you, if you're watching it closely, you can see it encroaching into more and more different areas. And I see it touching pretty much every business vertical that's out there. But I have a particular interest in healthcare, watching it encroach into healthcare in very various different positive ways and uh, education. 
two areas that I think are going to change pretty dramatically over the in the next decade or two. So as we talk about artificial intelligence domestically or how it impacts the U.S. or the West, what are your thoughts about China's ramp up in artificial intelligence? It's very, very interesting because China has made it very clear it's a priority for them. Have other countries not coming out and making bold statements like China. You know there's a lot of activity going on in the U.S. And uh, actually, earlier in the year, a member of the current administration said that artificial intelligence wasn't something that was a primary focus for them. They felt it was 10 years off. I think that's dead wrong. But with regard to China, China showed all its cards. You know the U.S. is working on it. Uh, you know Europe's working on it. Certainly, you know, Russia, even though Russia's not talking much about it, you know, they're working on it. Although Putin did recently come out and say that the first one to AGI or human level intelligence is really going to have a leg up over everybody else. China has done some incredible things. You know, they have companies like Baidu and, and some of the other large companies that they have. And they've, they've really gone from zero to Mach 5 in no time flat. I know recently Eric Schmidt made a public statement about, hey, listen, don't underestimate China in the AI world. He goes, they have some brilliant people out there. And I think they're demonstrating it. It's like any other major technology. It's going to take time to mature. It seems as though they're very willing to make the financial and time commitment, and they're trying to train as many people as possible. It's going to have a major impact on their society like everybody else. It's, sadly enough, it's probably going to displace some people. When I'm talking AI, I'm talking not only software, but robotics. That's certainly going to displace some people. Foxconn has already made major steps in that direction, and those will continue. How will the Chinese government respond to that from a public perspective is, is yet to be seen. If there's a potential of displacing a lot of people that are currently working, I think every government's got to take a critical look at that and, and decide how we're going to handle that. And I think other countries are going to run into the same situation. For China, whose economy is basically based on labor, they have an insane population. They can throw people at problems. For them to decide to shift to automation, artificial intelligence, and robotics, to shift their economy in that direction with such a large population, what do you think their strategy is for that? That's a good question. With the advent of AI and automation, even though you do have a large labor force and even though the labor force is relatively inexpensive, automation, AI, and robotics over time will still prove to be cheaper. And in order to compete in a global world, cost is king. What are they going to do with, let's say, to displace people? I don't know. There's probably a lot of different strategies. There certainly will be new work coming up that people can do, as, and this will happen all over the world. I'm not quite sure that the new jobs that come over the horizon are going to offset the losses, but let's assume that there's still a lot of displaced people. I've read about strategies where they essentially governments make work. They make things to do so people can go out and just keep them busy. What is China specifically going to do? My guess is it'll probably be a mix of a variety of different things. You'll have the new jobs coming up. They'll probably make work in some sectors. And other than that, China has the same problem that every other country has will have over time. It's just a different scale than most other countries. You know, certainly other countries like India. India is going to run into exactly the same problem. In some ways, China might actually be better positioned to handle the job displacement because they're a socialist country. So like you said, they can assign jobs to people. They can put people to work. They could give people a basic income. And then secondarily, something that you had said earlier specifically around Eric Schmidt and Google, there was an article that I posted a while ago that basically stated how hard it is for tech companies in the U.S. to have artificial intelligence talent. And they're actively trying to avoid raiding the universities so yeah. people can get trained up. But there's a dramatic mm -hmm. talent shortage, and it seems like there's expertise in China. On the first one, you're right. I think the Chinese society will have Let's call it an easier time with the challenge of uh, labor displacement than other countries simply because they're socialist. They'll probably have certain functions that they set aside as labor functions, but eventually they're going to have to do something beyond that, maybe some sort of UBI or some kind of a socialist program to support the masses. You know, there's other countries that are looking at things like UBI and, and they're experimenting with them. And China's going to have the problem. They're going to have it on a larger scale. Other countries are going to have the same problem. With regard to the talent, Several years ago, Andrew Ng from Stanford, probably one of the premier AI experts in the world, I believe he went over and he worked with Baidu. Okay. And what he did was he started, his, he was over there and he's trying to develop labs and talent and all that business. The feedback that he came back was, was they have some extremely talented people. Eric Schmidt followed that up with his recent comment. They have some extremely talented people. They probably have a raw talent deficit at the moment, but their government is dedicated to putting money behind training. 
one of the things that may be a challenge to them is because of the socialist nature of their society, innovation at times has been a challenge with them. Whereas if you go to Silicon Valley, everyone's got ideas and, you know, the atmosphere is a little bit freer. It may impact China in the short run. But with regard to raw numbers and raw talent, I think over time, you're going to see them being one of the top producers of AI talent in the world. Their focus somewhat concerns me. You and I kind of passed some articles back and forth the last few weeks. It seems like they are very interested in applying artificial intelligence technology to parse text and to monitor the population for dissenting political thoughts. Are you concerned that they're applying their talents and their knowledge and their skill set in the wrong direction by reinforcing a police state? I think that that's, that's a given. I believe they're going to continue to do that. I believe that as Internet of Things becomes more pervasive in China, they'll have a, they'll have a more granular look into anybody, anytime, anywhere they want. I believe that they're going to do that. I also believe that they're probably going to put a tremendous amount of resource into the military applications of AI. Both of those concern me. There's certainly, you know, they're doing a lot of commercial and retail types of things as well. But I think the government, I would suspect, of course, I haven't spoken to them, but I would suspect that most of it has to do with the social oversight, the military aspects, the military benefits that things like AI can bring to the table. So talking about their application and where they're heading and what their focus is, military, social monitoring, but from a population perspective, going back a couple of years when you saw all those factory workers and they were having those problems in the factories in Foxconn where people were jumping off the roof, Foxconn has almost admitted that it's very difficult for them to keep the factory staffed up and that's why they started looking at automation. But you have a younger population that doesn't mm -hmm. want to work 15 or 20 hours a day in a factory in a ghost city where there's nothing but work to do and they're living in dorms. You couple that with the automation and the artificial intelligence. I'm going to go back to the society question. What does that look like for that generation of workers? They don't want to be in the factories. The jobs are going to get displaced as they start to create a middle class. What happens there? Is that going to impact their ability to create a middle class and a consumer society, which China wants? In order to have a capitalist society, you need a consumer. Because of artificial intelligence and automation, we're going to be squeezing a lot of consumers out of the mix. What does that do to the overall system that you have in place? That's a big challenge. That's a big challenge for everybody. Now, other countries speak of something like UBI, which is universal basic income, you know, every month to get a check from the government. Is that the answer? I don't know. I think that it may help solve the personal wealth issue. How do I participate in this consumer society? But I'm not sure it properly responds to the human desire to be a part of something, be a part of something creative, be a part of something new, challenging, making mistakes, that sort of thing. All of those attributes, which are really all part of just being human. I don't know how you deal with that. And I'm not sure how they're going to do it. I just hope that they don't go in with a strong arm, you know, try to force society to go one way or another. As they create this consumer society, that creates competition. So we're already starting to see like Alibaba and what's the other one? Baidu. So Alibaba mm -hmm. and Baidu, they're starting to go at it now. They're starting to oh, yeah. poke at each other and start to kind of infringe on each other's sacred cows, core business. Do you think the government's going to step in and regulate that? Or do you think they're going to let them go at it? For the government to step back and leave it alone is more of a capitalist philosophy. You sent an article that I read recently where there was a uh, Chinese had a meeting of all the all the larger artificial intelligence companies and, and Jack Ma. He skipped. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if he skipped or he wasn't invited. You know, to me, if he skipped, that's one thing. If he wasn't invited, that tells me something totally different. It's always difficult to, to try to figure out how other countries are going to behave, especially countries like China. They have a different government, different society than we have. And it's uh, always a lot of questions coming out of China. As you and I are talking about China, I'm starting to think about how do U.S. companies fit into growing business in China? How does China come into the States and create their brands and their businesses? We're seeing a lot with consumer goods right now. Anchor, Huawei, even OnePlus. OnePlus is a Chinese brand that has a lot of brand loyalty in the States. You're seeing it in gadgets. You're seeing it in phones and knockoff automatic vacuum cleaners. That's driving Chinese brands right now. They're not hiding behind some old brand that they purchased, like a Zenith. They're branding with their Chinese company names, and they're getting yeah. traction in the States. But that's low margins, right? And they're good at low margins. If they're really going to compete in the States, it's software, it's cloud, it's AI. And then they're going to have to compete with the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsofts. 
What's your take on that battle? Do you think there's going to be a legitimate fight or are they just going to keep like a territory system and they're going to draw a line and be like, we're not going to infringe, we're not going to try? I would say that there's probably things that they're going to stay away from for the short term because they certainly have a, a full plate of products. But, you know, I'll give you one specific example. I know that they're putting a lot of money and energy into starting their own car companies. And uh, it was on several months back. I saw some of the Chinese automobiles. They were all electric. And, of course, they come with autonomous capabilities. You know, they had them at one of the car shows. I don't know if it was in Europe or it was in Asia. But they, you know, from the outside, they look like beautiful cars. It seems as though they're going to try to make a play in that space. And, and that will be interesting. With regard to trying to cringe on Google, Facebook, Microsoft, I think that's probably a little bit more of a of an uphill struggle for them, at least in the short term. But if they continue to develop their expertise in AI and they're fully committed to AI, they're working on quantum computing, they're working on, you know, they're working on their own processor designed to do AI, machine learning, deep learning type of calculations. My guess is they, they have the population, they have the government support, they have the capital. I think they're going to make some noise in that space. Now, the question will become... At some point in time, does a national government stand up and say that's enough? Um, does somebody raise the issue of security? You know, I bought this particular uh, mobile app from a Chinese company and come to find out that, you know, I'm streaming data off to somewhere in Peking. At some point in time, those issues will come into play. You know, we'll see how that all plays out as well. My phone, the OnePlus, they got pinged recently for sharing data. It was going back to China. Lenovo had the same problem. As a consumer, that is something that I'm consistently worried about. Like, what data is going back there? What are they doing with it? You mentioned something about the cars. I think the cars are like the canary in the coal mine with China for two reasons. What they're doing with solar energy, that's something we should stop and talk about and pay attention to because they're going to skip over us. In that space. Yeah, in that space. They're going to literally jump from fossil fuels to solar technology, and that's going to create an advantage because in 50 years, they're not going to be dependent on fossil fuels. And we're going to still have infrastructure that is dependent upon that. So as they bring all these rural areas into the modern age, they're literally going to jump right over the fossil fuels. Absolutely. And then you couple that with a consumer economy. You couple that with electric cars. And suddenly you have a country with people who can afford cars. They don't need fossil fuels to operate them. They aren't introducing all these horrible chemicals into the atmosphere. We can get into the environmental impact of what China does with their manufacturing. But theoretically, long term, they might go from one of the most polluted countries to one of the cleanest. There's a potential there, certainly. There was an article that I, I shipped out this morning that said China is willing to take a, I think it's a three-tenths hit on their GDP in order to focus on cleaning up pollution and to reducing their debt. They're still growing, and you know, instead of growing at 7.1%, they'll grow at 6.6 or 6.7, which is still significant. They clearly realize that they've created tremendous issues with their environment, with their, you know, uncontrolled growth and their massive use of fossil fuels. But they also recognize that it's time to clean it up. They're focusing a tremendous amount on solar. They're actually developing a ma massive solar, I don't know what to call it. Let's call it a solar farm in the cent central, I guess it's pretty close to India. But what they're looking to do is harvest solar energy and, and then, you know, use that internally, but also sell it run cables to Pakistan, India, Southeast Asia, Europe, the excess energy that they've reaped from the solar farm. These are all part of their plan. Very, very smart. How do you think the U.S. is going to respond to that from a competition perspective? <laughs> right now, on the solar energy part, it's my understanding that China is, a, is the leader in uh, development of solar panels. And production. Uh, and production, yep. I think it would behoove the United States to get involved a little bit more in that space. China right now has a cost advantage from twofold, well, actually threefold. Number one, automation. Number two, reduced labor costs, but also government subsidies. They're essentially doing the same thing with solar panels that they appear to do with steel, which is they drive the global price down so low that it forces other companies out of business. But I look at solar and actually all green energy is a strategic asset that needs to be nurtured and developed within each country. And I think here in the U.S., I believe we need to focus on that more. You know, we talked earlier about job offset in China with regard to automation, and we mentioned new jobs are going to be coming up. Well, guess what? Solar is going to be one of those spaces, and there's going to be a lot of solar-related jobs for the next 20, 30 years that could maybe offset some of the jobs that we've automated out of, out of existence. It certainly doesn't help with the current political climate in the States regarding renewable energy. And there's also a lot of dissension within the business units of America. Silicon Valley certainly has a certain opinion. It seems like the energy producers are in a different camp. We're not a unified front. 
as much as I say there's competition and they're sort of going at each other, if the government snaps the line, they're all going to follow. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, in China, you have a government that sits on top and essentially calls the shots. And certainly they'll take input and they might modify their direction based upon sensible input. But at the end of the day, they call the shots. Democracy is ugly and it's bumpy and it's definitely not point A to point B. It at times can be painful. You know, we're starting to see U.S. companies react to China's increasing presence in the States. Oracle is trying to make it harder for Chinese firms to buy U.S. companies. There's some legislation that's out there with the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States. They're trying to work it so it's much harder for a Chinese company to purchase a domestic firm. What are your thoughts on that? I have mixed opinion. I understand why they're doing it. People coming in with deep pockets and they're buying up everything left and right. And essentially, when they buy it, what they do is it's not just they're buying the business, but they're buying the intellectual property. And some of that intellectual property can be seen as being strategic and uh, critical to a nation. So I understand why they want to step in front of some of these efforts. However, it's also contrary to what a democratic society is. It brings up new challenges that we haven't faced before. And, you know, quite honestly, the tsunami of technology that we're going through now, which is AI, automation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is bringing up new challenges that we haven't faced before. Where are we going to come out at the end of those? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows at this time. But the fact that we're raising the issue we're putting on the table, I think, is is a great start. I don't love the fact that we can't go over there and invest and integrate with the community to the degree that, that they can come in, in here and do. They really just want us to inject money in their firms. Yeah, one of the other things, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is a fact, it's my current understanding is uh, oftentimes for a company to go into China, like a Facebook or a Google, they have to hand over a certain level of intellectual property in order to do business in a country. And they have to partner. They have to partner yeah. with a, a domestic yeah. firm or they have to establish a firm that yeah. is, that's 100% based in that country and mm -hmm. they can't have a majority ownership. I, I don't think that that's a sustainable thing from a U.S. or European perspective. Uh, however, you know, everybody wants access to that market. There's a lot of a lot of folks out there. So, you know, certainly between China and India, there's billions of consumers that they want access to. I have to believe that over time, they'll come to some sort of agreement where they'll soften that stance on the uh, access to intellectual property and allow the company to retain their own intellectual property. Because if they don't, essentially, you're handing over the, you know, the, the keys to the car to just anybody and very simple. Once you understand the technology, it's very uh, simple to replicate it and play for your own uses. With technology being what it is at the moment, how much longer are we going to have an advantage when you talk about automobiles or whatever special sauce the United States and European countries have when it comes to innovation? How much longer are we going to have that with the way information is flowing freely between all of these different countries? The businessmen in China can easily come here, stay here for a year, learn businesses, and then go back and take that information home with them. I don't think that advantage is going to exist much longer. And when you start to take those things off the plate because information is being shared globally and they already have this infrastructure and a government that's willing to just go, 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 that does not spell a good recipe for the rest of the world. Yeah, it doesn't feel right. But I can't believe that the U.S., Europe, the other countries are just going to roll over and accept that. In this hyper-connected exponential change world is now put in, uh, in front of a society and the politicians and the policymakers and say, okay, folks, now how do we deal with this? What do we do with this? Quite frankly, we haven't been here before. There are those who, who will say, oh, yeah, this is just more change. No, it's not more change. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot more change. It's a lot faster. And it reaches much more deeply into society than anything we've ever done before. And instead of taking a century to seep into the core of society, this has taken years. And that will only accelerate, in my opinion. How do we handle it? I don't know. I do think that the policymakers, and not just the U.S., but Europe and, and other countries, have got to engage a lot sooner, understand a lot sooner, and, and understand what the implications are before. It's like getting poison ivy, right? You got a little bump on your leg and you start scratching, you wake up the next morning, you're covered with poison ivy. But you have to recognize what, what poison ivy is. You're exactly. Talking, you're talking about policymakers, but there has to be an acknowledgement of a basic set of Yes. criteria or skill set to be a policymaker or a politician. And we don't like to say that in the United States, like you have to have a skill set. Correct. You know, they're not recognizing the issue. The world that many of them 
you know, quite honestly, including myself, the world that we were we were brought up in is not the world that exists today. But you adapted. And, That's the difference. You uh, jumped in. But guess what? The world that we're that we're sitting in today is going to be a lot different a week from now. And number one, you have to recognize that things have changed. And number two, you have to be willing to change with them. You, you know, it doesn't mean you necessarily have to agree with everything, but you have to understand the dynamics of what, of what was just put in front of you and take a critical look at it and say, okay, well, what's the best thing from a policy perspective? What's the best thing for our society with regard to this change or this thing that's coming our way? You know, there's times when policymakers are stuck in 1950. You know, the world is jettisoning out at Mach 2 and we're, you know, we've got our 1952 Ford going Electro glider, whatever heck they call them back then. There's a gap. It certainly was easier when you made a widget, a physical widget. You put it okay. on a boat and you shipped it somewhere. Logistics don't work that way nowadays. If you have a product, you have a piece of code, the likelihood is it's probably based on some other person's work and there's bits and pieces that are open source and that yields efficiencies, that yields speed. And it was built on collaboration, maybe from people from multiple countries. Yes. That's the reality of today, right? You have little bits and pieces of everything disintegrated and reassembled all over the place because there's no tangible product. It's all, it's all code and software. It's yeah. vaporware. It's not the physical asset anymore. It's not, I went, I worked made the five yesterday and I made 15 widgets, physical widgets. I can see them. I can stack them up on the desk. I, there they are. A lot of work today isn't like that. It's virtual. It's global. It's dynamic. It's intellectual. It's, it's just different. So it's hard to identify. Where do you see China going in the next five years? Well, I think that the main issue is what are truly ch uh, China's goals? Certainly, they're going to be, they'll be the largest economy in the world. They have a tremendous manufacturing base. They're developing a tremendous core of intellect that they can use to take themselves forward. What are they looking for? Now, one would hope that they're looking to uh, look at the globe as a global community, a global consumer base that I can sell not only domestically to my own people, but I could sell my, my goods around the, around the world. So it would be in everyone's advantage to get along. But if their goal is, is, and I don't know, I, I don't fear monger, but their, if their goal is global domination, I hesitate to think where that would, where that would lead us. So along those lines, any good business, whether it's a socialist economy or a capitalist economy, you need lines of money, you need credit coming in. I've been noticing that China is starting to, it seems like it's getting more difficult to get money over there on a couple of different levels. On a macro level, there was a really good Planet Money podcast about a hotel in like upstate New York. One of the reporters grew up in this little town and she worked at this hotel when she was a kid and she said it was a dump. And then through some research, she found out that this Chinese company, this Chinese holding firm bought the hotel. Long and short of the story, no major improvements have been done with the hotel. They bought it. And they, didn't, they haven't done anything with it. They're letting it kind of mm -hmm. rot. And they wondered why. And it sounds like it's getting increasingly more difficult for them to get lines of credit and money from the government. And then on a micro level, it seems like there is a bunch of startup predatory lending companies that are spinning up in China for these kids that don't want to work in these factories that are trying to make it on their own. And that's becoming a problem. The government's going after those small loan companies for a variety of reasons. Have you heard about anything like that? No, that I, that I wasn't aware of, but you know, quite honestly, it doesn't surprise me. You know, where there's money to be made, you get people trying to hit it from every angle, whether it's, you know, legit or not. We <laughs> just get the snakes in there. Yeah. They're actually going back to some of our earlier points around privacy. They're saying they can track people on their phones and they can track down where you are and send the, send the guy out to collect the money. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Certainly, you know, with the technology of a smartphone today, that, that should be easy enough to do. Set out the hitman to get, to get the money back. That, uh, that's an interesting twist. Is, yeah. there, is there anything that you feel like we haven't covered regarding China that you want to hit? Obviously, China is a, is a juggernaut. I'm very pleased to see their efforts to clean up their pollution. I think that that's long overdue. Maybe one other thing. China is a primary source of a lot of strategic metals. They have a... Uh, a heads up over the rest of the globe on, I think titanium is one of them, but there's a, there's a variety of, ver of, uh, strategic metals. Some of them are used in the iPhone. The only place or the primary place to get them in the globe is China. They haven't played that card against the world or the U.S. yet, but they have that one in their back pocket. And that, that concerns me. That's complicated because you're either getting them from yeah. like geopolitical areas that are really, those resources are funding bad governments or bad regimes, 
or you have in other situations where they can be used le as leverage, like in China, especially when there's scarcity. Precious metals are one thing, you know, so if you had gold and silver, that's one thing. But when you get into strategic metals, things that they use on the new latest and greatest military equipment and their critical elements for those particular devices, that's a different story. It's not just like I can't get, you know, my girlfriend or wife a diamond or, or a gold cross or a chain or whatever. The different level of potential control that they have, that, that concerns me. Not to kind of go off topic here, but in the next 50 years, you're going to see a lot of countries start to run out of things whether it's water or fossil fuels or metals, you're going to start to see a lot of artificial banana republics in the coming years. And how we respond to those issues and how the world responds to those problems is really going to, that's what's going to define humanity. You know what? That's yeah, put perfectly. It's not about China. It's not about the US. It's not about the EU. It's about humanity. As the world becomes a more connected place, as it becomes actually a smaller place as a result of that connectivity, we become absolutely codependent upon each other. The sooner that we realize that, and we stop playing, you know, one against the other, I think the better off we'll be. Well, John, do you want to plug anything? Do you, is there anything you want to kind of throw out there? No, this is, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I enjoy this. Thank you so I much for joining. You, uh, yeah, I appreciate you can uh, reach out and considering me for this uh, conversation. All right. Well, John, thank you again. I really appreciate your time. We have been talking about doing this for like a yes. year. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it very much. I, you know, I missed the last one. And I apologize for that, but this was uh, terrific. Really appreciate it. And there was my interview with John Drum. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll admit that I kind of have a problem ending the interviews. They never end clean. If anyone listens to Nerdist, I need an outgoing phrase like enjoy your burrito so everybody knows that it's the end of the episode. Feel free to make some suggestions, listeners. And that's all we have for this week. You can find us Westcast on iTunes, Google Music, and all of your favorite podcasting applications. Sourcecast is recorded in Bucolic, Mandra, New Jersey, and it's produced by my dad. The outro is performed by me, Ben Lombardi, and music is provided by Patrick Lee. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week.